Tonight on the Cooligans, we are joined by the Philly man himself, Jim Curtin wow. of the Philadelphia Union, the head coach. Yo, and he shows us his sneakers. Let's go. <laughs> okay. It gets pretty intense uh, today. So all this and more today on the Cooligans. Baby, we got a head coach. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now you know this is. Uh, I think this immediately just adds to the legitimacy of this show. Right? Uh, and that's the last thing we should be is legitimized <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> yeah. I guess. I, I think we've just learned that this. Uh, you know, this head coach is. It feels like he made a terrible mistake. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah he's like, oh no. <laughs> but instead of, on Twitter, instead of a blue check, we should have a red X next to my name. <laughs> so people with real jobs in soccer know not to come here. But we are actually really excited, um, uh, especially to have someone, you know, MLS legend at this point. Yes. Player. Be before, before, hold on. Before yeah. we introduce our guests, we have to we introduce ourselves. Our. That's a good point. Good point. <laughs> so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Polanco. I'm Alexis Guerrero. All right. We are the Cooligans. We are your favorite stand-up comedians that host the funniest soccer show that you have ever seen, Absolutely. witnessed, uh, or been, been a part of. Uh, you heard, you've seen, you felt. Stop touching the television. <laughs> and we're not just the funniest, we're also the gulliest. Correct. Uh, and I'm glad we we have, uh, you know, not only just a a, a, a great head coach, but a, a, a real Philly dude, you know, yeah, a real dude. Philly bro. Uh, uh, the, let's say the pride of, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Orland, Pennsylvania? <laughs> yeah, Orland. Oh. It's like Ireland with an O, because we want to confuse you. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, unless you're driving, put your hands together for the one, the only... Coach Jim Curtin. Hey, Jim. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me, Alexis and Christian. Great to be here. And uh, thanks for entertaining uh, the fans during these crazy times. <laughs> Dude, we're trying, man. We're trying our hardest. What um, I guess first question is, uh, we, we're going to talk a little bit about your past just, and be, what you're doing be, now. Before okay. you continue, Alexis, I, I just got to say, it feels really good when a coach praises you in, in any way at, at all. <laughs> right? You know what he did? He took I'll us to the going. side. I can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> you know what we did? We worked hard in training, and he pulled us to the side. He put his arm around us, and he said, hey, I'm watching. You're doing a good job. <laughs> you're not there yet, right? Because you got to keep you got to keep us. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> honestly, though, you guys, honestly, you guys have brought cool to soccer, which is, uh, I think, a big step. You know, I think you need more people that not only know the game, but also now know the difference between uh, an Air Force One and a Jordan One. That matters, you know. Let's so, go. Like, oh. cool is, is I told I you he's a Philly dude. <laughs> Yo, that means the world to us that you would say that. Um, why don't we Why don't we start a little bit about like uh, you know, you you're a Philly dude, right? Like Orland is a suburb of Philly, essentially. Like, yeah. how does it how how does it feel to sort of get to the point where you're now the head coach and a, re a really successful head coach of a local team that didn't exist when you were a kid? Yeah, look, I grew up uh, in the Philly area rooting for, you know, Randall Cunningham and Charles Barkley and, and different Philadelphia legends. And, and, you know, there wasn't a soccer team here in the city. So I had a, a playing career uh, in Chicago and then at Chivas USA, uh, RIP. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, from there, I was, was fortunate enough to get into coaching in the academy, work my way up uh, and then become the head coach in my hometown. So uh, as cliche as it sounds, it is a, a dream come true for sure. Um, but also, um, you know, you have that weight uh, and that feeling that you want to do good for your city. And, and you know, Phillies, I know you guys are, are New York guys, uh, so you guys understand how the media can be, you know, intelligent, but also hard, you know, hard and fair. Um, you know, there's, there's no better place than an East Coast city for me that, you know, um, when you do have success, you're kind of, uh, it goes a long way and, and you have to earn your respect along the way. So it's been a, a real honor uh to be honest and and to work with young kids through our academy that eventually become pros is something special and, and hopefully we've put a product on the field now uh, that philadelphia is can get get behind you know yeah. east coast is very parochial you know we like our yeah. own and um the union our philosophy is uh is that so yeah, it, it's been like, well, we went to uh, our first Philadelphia Union game uh, last season. And, you know, we've been around the country, gone to a lot of games. You meet MLS fans in general, and some are a little bit more rowdy than others. Some are a little right. bit, a little, you know, it can be a little rough around the edges. But Philly was, I'm like, oh, this is definitely Philadelphia. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> we you went to like a local bar, and uh, what was Sebastian Latou? 
he's just hanging out, you know, with the fans. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, isn't he a legend? Didn't he score the first goal in the stadium? And he's just like, but it wasn't like a superstar was there. It was like, oh, that's our homie Seb. Have you talked to Sebastian Lato? You know, it's like, it's what yeah. Philly is a different place in that sense where it's a big city but also feels like a small town in some instances where like you have to be connected to the fans. Does that ever make your job a little harder? Uh, yeah, look, I think it, it's a, it's a great thing to have seen now the evolution, not just the Philadelphia union in the city, but also soccer, you know, where you can turn on the TV now and you can watch the English league. You can go to a bar and watch the Bundesliga if that's your league. And it's, it's on TV all day. Then you can tune in and watch three MLS games in a row. I never thought that would happen in my lifetime. I have to be honest. But yeah, just by walking around the neighborhood, I live in the city. I live downtown now with my, my three kids and my wife. And, you know, you see a lot of Arsenal jerseys. I see your old school one there. Um, you know, you see uh, different soccer uniforms and jerseys walking through the neighborhood on little kids. But now you're starting to see a lot more uh, Philadelphia Union and MLS uh, support and love. And listen, it's a good thing because I, uh, I get praise when I'm walking around and we get a win. And then also they'll let you know some, okay. some ideas, uh, we'll just say, <laughs> uh, when things don't go so well. So it's, it's the way it is, you know. And, and again, um, it's not dissimilar to New York. You know, we have a, uh, a firm and hard but fair fan base, you know. I just appreciate the delivering soccer advice. Do you know what I mean? Like coming from a Philly accent, it's just like, whoa, because there's something about soccer that you feel like you have to be knowledgeable. It's like a very intellectual game, but coming from the Philadelphia accent, it's just like, whoa, how do these two things come? Yeah. <laughs> it's the, the Delco accent in particular, oh, when you hear it, bad, man. when you bad. hear it, I'm like, do are you using your tongue in a reverse <laughs> way from every other human being on the planet? Yeah. Yeah. Um, for that, but but there's something cool about someone in New York being like, "Yo, my guy, we got to get back to a three man back, so, you know." Back, <laughs> and I was like, when you hear that now, because I grew up in an era where when you talked about soccer, it was probably for me. I grew up in Newark, New Jersey. It was all, all all of us immigrant kids that were talking about. It. Even though I'm Cuban, I hung out with like the Portuguese, the Brazilians, the Grenadians, the Trinidadians, and Jamaicans, and we all talked about it. It was all like our local dialect. But now to hear a kid from Delco talking about what the <laughs> Philadelphia Union need to do while they're buying a Philly cheesesteak, that's not a that's not a Philly you grew up in. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, don't tell don't. Did you refer to me as Delco? Don't no. call me that. No, no, no. I would never disrespect you like that, Coach. <laughs> no, Delco, Delco, uh, Delco is a different. It's a different one. I, I don't know how to describe it. There's counties in 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 our. Uh, there's counties everywhere, but there's counties in Philadelphia, and Delco is one that they have county pride, which is is uh, it's unique. You know, I grew up in Montgomery County, and and now I'm in Philadelphia. Um, but their pride in their area is 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 strong. Their accent is terrible, but at least they have uh, you know, a, a strong belief in, in what they're about. And look, a lot of our fans are from from Delco. So I'm joking. But at, at the same time, you're right, man. The, the cool thing about our sport and our game is, you know, we have guys in, in our area from all over the, the world. Uh, our locker room alone has 12 different countries represented. You know, um, you know, some don't speak English. They're taking English classes with uh you know, with our, our support staff that we have. But um, the cool thing is the game speaks one language. And and you can argue, like you said, over things about is it a back four or a back three? Do we change formations when we play uh, against LAFC or New York City FC? Uh, do we adjust? You know, so that's the cool thing. Um, the game kind of speaks one language. And, and again, the diversity of it is, is something that truly makes it special. Absolutely. We got more with Coach when we get back after this. Maybe we're back even more with Coach Jim Curtin of the Philadelphia Union. Uh, we were talking a little bit about uh, what it means to be from Philly and playing Philly or to coach in Philly, but you didn't get a chance to play in Philly. But you're kind of, I mean, you know, your time in Chicago and in Shivas was pretty big. What what did it take for you to get to that point? Like, were you were you always looking at a chance at, look, at playing in MLS? Did you have hopes of maybe trying, you know, going to Europe and maybe giving that a go? But you got to uh, Chicago. What was that like getting to Chicago? Yeah, I was a late bloomer in, in, in soccer, and, and the league wasn't as strong as it is now. You know, So when I got drafted out of Villanova, um, it was literally a call from, from Bob Bradley directly, and he said, do you want to come try out for the, for this team? We're in preseason now. And I said, well, I'm in finance class, so uh, <laughs> maybe finish up here, then I'd come down. And he was kind of like, well, you have a better chance if you you know, if you came down and joined us now. And I, I moment of truth, literally walked out of the finance class and 
uh, cruise down to Florida. You know, you look at the the roster that I walked into. You had Jesse Marsh, Chris Armis, uh, C.J. Brown. You had Ante Razov. You had Josh Wolf was there at the time. So you, you could reel off. I think it's like twelve or thirteen names that are now coaches or assistant coaches in our league. Carlos Bocanegra was on the yeah, team, yeah. Uh, GM in Atlanta. So it was this. I got lucky, man. Like anything in life, right time, right place, uh, right club drafted me. I, I barely made the team as the last man on the roster, and uh, but was in this environment where they challenge you to learn every day. And I almost saw the game like a coach, I think, about a year and a half into things. So it was early. I was 21, 22 years old, and these guys were older than me, but they were teaching the game like a coach. So, again, a little bit lucky and in, in being in that environment and just kind of grew from there and, and had a decent – playing career i was a role player on some really good teams so i did get some individual accolades but uh had some trophies that we won and it was a great time um got into coaching though at a pretty young age and started in my in the academy which is something i think is good for all young coaches to work with young players um see what that's like try things make mistakes and then uh, eventually became the assistant coach and, and ultimately the head coach of the philadelphia union so that's a quick snapshot but overall a uh, really fun career and fortunate to do something that i love did it seem like a natural progression for you especially uh working with bob bradley did it was there anything about his coaching style or maybe interview style with uh with <laughs> <laughs> that, that you get from him <laughs> so bob's intense i think there's no secret there bob um to be honest has 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 really lightened up a lot in recent okay. years that might be crazy for you guys a lot of people are like from what <laughs> where was I know. where was I he know. yeah so i mean he's a guy who look i walked into the locker room i was 21 years old i had no idea if i was gonna was good enough you know i was Risto stoichkov was on our team peter novak was on our team it was just this eric winaldo was sneakily there for a year it was crazy so i'm playing with a bunch of guys that i looked up to um and then there's bob who you know, again, is intimidating, man. There's there's no other way to put it. When you first meet him, it's intimidating because he's he's intense and he's all about football. He's all about soccer and he just wants to win. Uh, so um, the easiest way I can describe him to people is um, if you had moments where you thought you had a good game. And again, he took a chance on me and put me in the lineup as a, a rookie and I played a lot of games. He he if you played a bad game. Um, he'd put his arm around you and you'd go through, this was VHS days too, man. This is old school. Yeah. So it was stop, rewind, and you'd sit next to him for an hour and he'd show you all the great things you did in that game. And you're kind of going like, I had the worst, I felt like I had the worst <laughs> game of my life, but he, he'd make you feel oh, good okay. about it. And then you'd play a great game, what you thought was your best, <laughs> and it's right back in there again. And yeah. he's showing every detail of what you could have done better. So his best quality is you, you never wanted to let him down, almost like a father. You know what I mean? You yeah. don't want to let your, your family members down. It was more that feeling than anything else. And he's, his, his resume and how brave he is going overseas and coaching in different environments and, and taking on new challenges is something that I, I look up to a lot. Um, you know, and there's always people that are going to talk negative about different things in, the, in, in, in different areas along your, your pathway. But his, his – uh, coaching tree as you'd speak all the people that are underneath of him yeah he's, he's done a lot of great things for the game certainly what and, is you it know, what is it about him that half the i would say the overwhelming majority of players you've mentioned have gone on to become coaches and in a lot of cases successful coaches or successful assistants and and just yeah. now have this other, what is it about his coaching style that that made is it did you always plan to be a coach or you just watch bob and you're like i think i could do that <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. It's, an, it's a great point, too. Uh, you know, look, Bob, uh, the way he challenged you, and again, it's going to sound cliche, but the environment that he created in that locker room, it was so intense during the week and the training sessions and the, the fist fights. Like I tell my players now, like there would be in this locker room, I'm, I'm talking about guys would get knocked out like unconscious in training <laughs> sessions, like one punt, like it was, it was bad a couple times a week where the games became easy. So it was, it was just so intense and so competitive. And and then when Bob would step out of the room, guys are still arguing over plays on the video. So yeah. everyone kind of talked and had this, um, this intensity about the game. He just made um, everyone into want... Jersey dudes. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, well, yeah. Exactly. I think Bob Bradley, Bob Bradley was refing a fight club. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. 
there was some uh, I, I won't use names but there were some people that got uh, got dropped once once in a shower i mean it was there was some weird stuff going yeah, on but yeah. I, I'm, I'm like this young kid and i'm kind of going like <laughs> dude these guys are yeah these guys are all about it and they the i'm telling you the intensity of training was harder the games became easy for us and if you look at some of the score lines this was old school mls so i got at one point there's only 10 teams in the league but you know we, we would kill teams it was crazy you know they're, they're doesn't exist anymore where it's like um i don't want to say easy games but in our league now there's no there's no one you look on the the the, the schedule and you yeah. go okay if we just show up we should take care of business here and there were some of them back back in those days i think you can look up uh, us versus tampa i think i think there was like a 12 and 0 against them in, yeah. in those games and it was a lot of four and five zero so the, the, the times are totally different the league's uh much better and stronger now but um the the environment Bob created, man, it was so intense and it was it was just good players too and, and that helped a lot and everybody pushed each other in a way that kinda made you think of the game as a coach. Okay. All right. All right, we'll be back with more Jim Curtin right after this. <laughs> We are back with head coach of the Philadelphia Union, Jim Curtin. Uh, coach, I did want to ask you about about the team itself and and the, the philosophy of the team because Philadelphia Union fans tend to be the the louder than I think other uh, so, so, some of the other teams. So I, I'm curious about how, the approach of you know because we, we know uh, the, the Philadelphia Union are the the the, the strategy is not to uh, sign a 10 million dollar player and and uh, and get them on the squad and then you know and hope they get 40 goals in a season it is it, it is a different approach how have you uh, managed to find success in that and uh is it is it a is it your mentality simply oh this is this is what i have to deal with or uh is it do you is it frustrating at all or you know how, how do you uh, navigate it yeah, look, I think, um, you know, the philosophy of the, the Philadelphia Union is, is to build from within, for sure. Uh, so, like, as you mentioned, we're not just going to go out and, and, and buy Ibrahimovic. That's not in our in our DNA. Uh, we also want to be innovative. You know, we're, we're pretty advanced in terms of our, our whole scouting and, and technology department, uh, our analytics department. We take that very seriously. So we're, we're looking for creative ways to, you know, um, you know, if we line up and go toe-to-toe -to -toe every game against, you know, some of these – uh, David Villa from your guys team yeah. you know, day in and day out, uh, that's going to be difficult. So um, we believe now if we do produce uh, academy players that are in our system from age eight to when they turn professional for some of them, um, that's a real advantage for us. So uh, it's a little bit of a, a slower build in the, in the philosophy. Um, I know, like he's mentioned, sometimes Philadelphia, you know, wants it right away and they see, uh, Atlanta and, and LAFC come into the league and, and make an immediate uh, impact. Uh, but if you do look at us now over the past five seasons, um, we've improved our point total each year, which is, is something we're proud of. And a lot of teams, I don't think any other team has actually. Um, there's always been a regression. So we've been moving forward. Um, I get that that sometimes is slow. Um, we took a big step last year with our first playoff win. Um, but overall, you know, philosophically, we do believe in the in the Philadelphia player. I believe strongly in the American player uh, in our league, in our country. Uh, and I ultimately, as cheesy as it sounds, I want this country to to have success at a win at a World Cup uh, and, and eventually move on and, and win it. And it might not be in my lifetime, uh, but at the same time, I want to work towards that. Uh, and that's kind of a snapshot of uh of the club and, and the vision of the club. Yeah, is there, is there a, a, a sense of pride when you can when you get one of your especially ac academy players to uh, play on the national team? Yeah, I think that's a, a huge step for us as a club. And, and look, uh, not every kid from our academy is going to make it and, and turn pro. Um, but if you can have, as we do now, five and six guys out there uh, that, that know the philosophy, know the style of play we want to play, uh, have been in the system, and, and they're a good – seven out of 10 every game. They're the guys that make a coach uh, sleep well at night. And we can add a, a couple of really strong international players into that mix. Um, look, our academy aspires to produce the next Landon or the next Clint Dempsey. Uh, but at the same time now, if you can produce 10-year pros, like I said, that make a coach sleep easy at night yeah. and you know what you're going to get out of them every day uh, because I've been around them uh, for so long, 
uh, that's powerful, uh, and you're starting to see it. You know, clubs like FC Dallas has done a good FC Dallas has done a good job. Uh, our big rival Red Bull has done a good job of putting players, uh, you know, in the national team and in the first team. And now the Philadelphia Union, I think, is in that um, category of teams. And you know, next step for our club, we're a little bit younger than some of the clubs I just mentioned. Ultimately, we, we do want to sell players and then invest that money back into whether it be our academy, whether it be into a new DP, whatever it is. So there is a a long-term vision uh, for sure, you know, and again, in soccer, you have your your day-to-day, which is us to win an MLS Cup, or that's our that's our goal. Uh, you have a, a three-year plan and then maybe a five-year plan, but ultimately winning and success is the only thing that allows you to kind of drive towards that plan, and, and that's kind of the equity we have right now with our fan base is we're actually having success on the field, yeah. so that's a good thing. You And, and, and this, that's a, it says a lot, too, because I, I remember a few years back, uh, you know, you were kind of on a hot seat for, for, sure. for the lack of a better term. And it seems like from that point, it's almost sort of solidified Philadelphia Union. And maybe it comes from your direction or maybe it comes from something else. But it seems like does it matter what's happening? It doesn't. The fans were angry about not having a big name player and, and, and whatnot. Sure. But it seems that regardless of what happens, you're able to sort of get the most out of your players. What is that a system you've inputted? Is that something that comes from the Philadelphia Union way? What makes it so that you're able to get the most out of your players yeah look there's the, your, your point is is totally accurate you know there was there was times i was a young coach that was kind of finding my way and it was there was some chaos uh, in and around me and and there's always noise certainly from the outside um and i've, I've had i think four different sporting directors in, in five seasons so there's different philosophies come in but i've always looked at that as as a positive you know uh, for example we had uh you know ernie stewart who was very possession based and he wants to keep the ball uh, and like a barcelona type um and I, I took different ideas from that and we became a pretty darn good possession team um ernst has come in now um and is more of the red bull thinking and the cool thing about soccer is you can you can look at the game a million different ways yeah. um you know but you know right now and I, i'm you know with Ernst and, and working with him and, and the ideas he has about pressing and, and going on trips to, you know, Red Bull Salzburg and seeing how Jesse Marsh works and, and different things you can pick up along the way. I think we've got a decent blend of, of those two things. Um, we're certainly working harder uh, to get better against the ball. That's our big goal. You know, so you, you watch modern soccer now and it's the Liverpools, the quick counterattacks and, and, and just how, good they are defensively to the you know how quick they can transition from defense to attack and that's something that we're working on as a club uh right now so in in a long-winded way there you know i've had uh, a lot of different leadership but I, I've, I've learned a ton from each and i respect all the the guys that i've had the, the opportunity to pick their brain and, and learn from and grow as a coach and what what who's uh you know offensive philosophy is it to uh hit the uh let el Sino out of the cage button yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, oh, wait we it. need a goal oh let's just bring <laughs> yeah, in el Sino. Yeah. <laughs> that's the other thing you know so again i think ernst has come in and, and instilled an, an incredible new philosophy with that throughout the whole club in in terms of you know playing high pressure and, and winning balls and, and scoring but none of us can take credit for what El Senior <laughs> does man I mean what a luxury I have to just kind of you know once it gets up around 40 50 minutes gone or 60 minutes whatever it is uh you put him in there and guys I'm telling you you guys don't get to see the good stuff the good stuff's in training when he's really like I don't I, I got nothing to lose <laughs> he does things to guys that like it's it's unbelievable to see every day um he's so special and, and we're really lucky to have him and you know yeah can it, change a game instantly if, if he if he was on your uh, Chicago fire team a lot of fist fights uh <laughs> <laughs> a lot of angry guys man. Yeah. a lot of angry guys for sure we got more I'm with coach you. when we get back after this yeah it's crazy man <laughs> We're back with Coach Jim Kern of the Philadelphia Union. Um, you brought something up before. You said your big rival, New York Red Bulls. Why isn't D.C. a bigger rival? It's so close to you guys. And are you just not going to have one of these bloodthirsty rivalries until Pittsburgh gets a club? <laughs> <laughs> I think, no, your point's fair. I think that, you know, look, I think we try to create rivalries sometimes. And, and maybe I'm even wrong in saying Red Bulls won. But I think... Now that there is a playoff game and a playoff history with us and them, I think that starts a rivalry. You know, we haven't had that yet with D.C., and we haven't been to enough playoff games uh, to really create the the true hatred and, and rivalries that you get uh, over time. 
Um, you know, but proximity certainly uh, adds a little more to it. We've always had some heated battles with DC, so Red Bull's just the closest one. And you know, Philly always has a, a little edge with New York, and we always <laughs> feel like the, the little brother. Although that's changing a little bit now. We're kind of like our, our city's pretty cool. We yeah, got good yeah. restaurants. Yeah, for sure. I'm a New York guy. I'm a New York guy. I, I love New York. My brother and sister both lived there forever. My brother's still there. Um, so again, it's a great city, but you know, it's just natural back and forth and joking around. Can we talk about that, uh, that playoff game with the New York rebels a, a little bit? Because that was one of the, wow. I, I mean, I, I think it was one of the greatest ever MLS playoff games. It was exciting uh, for us where we were sitting. <laughs> coach. There's, there's, yeah. You got, you guys were probably happy. I think yeah. right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're both New York city fans. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah okay, good. So, so what was, uh, how did you uh, sort of approach that game, especially when it, uh, going into, Uh, uh, extra time uh, I, I, and the insanity. Were you worried about the, the you know, fatigue? What, what was it, the exact mentality? Because, uh, I mean, the, the game was just unbelievable. It was wild. And, and you ask how I approached it. I obviously didn't approach it good from the start because we got down 2-0 <laughs> pretty early. And that was, that was tough in our, home, in our home stadium where you could almost feel over the crowd like the, ah, oh, here we go. You know, that, that, that negative energy started to creep in. Um, there's so many little moments in that game. They just replayed it back here in Philly. Obviously, everybody's staying inside and staying safe and healthy right now, but they just replayed it. And there's so many small moments. You know, Bedoya's goal um, to make it 2-1 gave us life again. And then we, Andre makes a mistake to make it 3-1 before half, and you're back down two goals. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the message at, at halftime was, you know, we actually played a good half. We just made uh, some some big mistakes in front of goal. Um, that we need to clean up. Um, we were creating chances. Um, they had an injury or two to players. If you go back and watch it, the kid Sims gets hurt and has to go out with the concussion. Right, right. Um, so that challenges you know, their depth a little bit. Um, we have the wild card of throwing El Sino into a game late, you know, which <laughs> helped a lot. Um, the craziest moment, I could talk forever about that game, so I won't bore you guys, but the craziest moment that would have been the all-time – worst biggest blooper whatever you want to call it like leon let type fumble yeah, in the end yeah, zone yeah. <laughs> is when we we actually scored to make it uh to go up what we thought was two goals at the time in extra time and marco fabian fafa and who else was over there there's one other guy that was over oh and, and sergio santos are overtaking selfies With the fans, there's literally like four, five seconds left. It's like the last kick. The goal, the goal gets called back. Are we have we're right, right, right. Get the yeah, tape. I remember we have this. six guys on the field. <laughs> That's it. You know, like because everyone else is getting the gram late. <laughs> exactly. And they're they're literally jogging on. They're behind Luis Robles, who's like taking the final yeah. kick to put it in our box. If we like don't win that head ball and they score and tie it, like that is an all time like, disaster. <laughs> Just moment. blunder. But, but there are so many wild things in that game. That was a cool one as a coach to be a part of but man my, my players just were so proud of them they left it all in the field and then sent the philadelphia fans home happy this is special. this is my question for for soccer coaches because the joke is or like sometimes it's said that you can only coach during training and at halftime when you're out there you're essentially yelling at the players that are closest <laughs> to you although your voice carries a little right. bit uh right. what is it during a game like that, do you look over your system and go, this is a good one? Like, are you in that mindset? <laughs> like, what do you, what, what are you focusing on? Or how can you even see the field at that level? Yeah. Like, what, what are you really looking at? Your point's amazing. And I've, I've actually had discussions recently with different coaches in the league. And it's like, I think we're going to get to a point because my view of the game is actually the worst view possible. Yeah. Like, I'm so low. I'll, it's chaos. Everything's 100 miles an hour. You can't really make plays out. I think it'll eventually get to some head coach is going to have the guts to do it and take the first step and have his assistants be down there, and he goes to the top. I'm being serious, like yeah. almost like an offensive coordinator in football. Someone's going to do it eventually, and it's going to I, I do believe that. Um, but to your question, like you can feel – I'll use our LAFC game before this whole thing got, got stopped. The the speed, the intensity of that game, where, like I look at Pat Noonan and he looks at me, and Oka, Oka Nikolov's my other coach who played 20 years in the Bundesliga, and he's like, yo, this is a, this is a different <laughs> level. Game. It's, it's going. Both teams are going at it, and there's no time to think. So you can feel that when you're down there for sure. Um, you know, I, I do agree with your point. When you train so hard during the week and you prepare them as best you can, once the opening whistle blows – You know, as a former player, you, you feel helpless. You kind of look out there and maybe a guy's struggling and they, they look over and, you know, they're, they're 
kind of give you the, the blank stare of what do I do with Joseph Martinez? And I kind of go, I, I don't know. <laughs> I can't help you. You know, you're on your own, man. It's tough. Um, you want to help. It's just a, it's a difficult feeling sometimes when, uh, when the game plan maybe doesn't go as planned, you know, it's the old famous Mike Tyson line, you know, uh, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face, man. And you have to be able to adjust And the players. You hope you prepare them um, not just for the game plan, but also if, if X happens or they change this tactically, uh, how do we counterpunch that? So you're trying to have them as prepared as possible, and sometimes it goes great, uh, and sometimes it doesn't. You guys are stand-up comedians, right? Yeah. Like, I, I listen to a ton of um, stand-up podcasts now, so I'm a big fan of, you know, whether it's Bill Burr or Joe Rogan yeah, yeah. or, or Chris D'Elia. You hear these guys talk, and I'm, I'm being dead serious. When you hear the euphoria of when they have a great set, um, it's a great feeling, just like a coach. But then they also talk about, and these are these are the best, right? Yeah. These are the best guys at it. They still talk about bombing, and I actually love hearing yeah. them talk about when Bill Burr is talking about, like, oh man, jumped into the comedy cellar and I had a shocker. Like to hear him talk about that, it's it's just like that, guys. It really is. Yeah. I think it's the closest thing. I don't know what stand up <laughs> yeah. is like, but you got to be brave to do it. But that that connection I, I think is a real one because when i hear them talk it always gets me a little bit like god that's exactly like the feeling of coaching when it goes good but then you get humbled so quickly yeah. too man you think you have the answers for a second and you think you're really doing well and then all of a sudden you get smacked uh, yeah by, when by... when all this uh when all this ends and we're doing stand-up again coach if you could be a resource for us if i can call yeah. you and talk yeah. about how i bought Anytime. <laughs> Anytime. man it will really it's a healthy feeling because I, I have to stand there on the sideline too and i'm looking out going like the fans are on you and you're kind of i'd say the only like, soccer player that doesn't understand that i couldn't relate to or that couldn't relate to a comedian is a goalkeeper because when they mess up they just yell at the defensive back line i can't do that <laughs> i can't it's, do that. That. it's, it's like blaming the audience I can't it's, be like, yo, this mic stand. It's the damn mic stand. <laughs> you know, I got nothing. <laughs> I'm by myself bombing up there. We got more with Coach when we get back after this. <laughs> We are back with Jim Curtin of the Philadelphia Union. Uh, so, Coach, I wanted to uh, talk to you about uh, something a bit more serious, uh, but this was uh, cheese steaks. I, I least, are we gonna cheese steaks. <laughs> We're gonna break this down. I heard serious. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I wanted well, to talk about pork? anyway. Go ahead. You the, the moment uh, uh, with uh, uh, your captain Alejandro Bedoya uh, during you know after another tragic uh shooting uh another tragic mass shooting uh he made global news uh when he you know a, a, as a player uh, after uh, scoring a goal uh grabbed the microphone and he yelled basically you know uh we need to end gun violence now uh, putting out a call to uh to government to congress uh and you were uh, very publicly uh, supportive of him uh what was how did that uh, you know I, 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 look, I'm not saying I don't think it was necessarily pl planned. I don't think he planned no, it. it wasn't. But but like, how did that um, sort of affect the, the, the team? How did it affect Philly? How did uh, what did you think? And and from a professional perspective, um, how, what was the, you know, the the thought process and, and uh, of how to, ha quote unquote, handle it, even though yeah. I'm 100 percent supportive of what he said? Of course. And you know, first of all, I was proud. You know, I was really, really proud when he did it. And, and the, the thing is, you know, with Ali, it was it was not one party or the other. It was just yeah. a, a, the comment of, you know, ending gun violence, which we all have to uh, be on board with. You yeah. know, nobody likes violence. And, you know, again, certain people are still going to like guns. But, um, you know, the, the, the message that he gave was one that was strong. It was brave. Um, and it's one that I fully supported uh, to do that. Uh, you know, it, as our captain, as our leader, uh, you know, and I, I can 100 percent say it was not planned. It was at least I didn't know about it. If it was, uh, it was, it was spontaneous. It was powerful. Um, and I, I think it makes me proud and it, it made the, the club proud. It's, it's what we are, I think, as a club. Um, uh, look, we have a young roster. We have a fearless roster and, and we're not afraid to challenge uh, things that we don't think are right. Um, 
Maybe is that that's your guys' term, gulliest? Yeah. Is that, do we, are we close? Are we getting close <laughs> no, a little bit? Was, no, getting, very, that was very gully as hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you know, you want to empower your players to be brave on the field, but also off the field, man. These these, these guys so so often are just everyone thinks they're they're like superheroes or different things. They're people. They have families. They have they have high times in life. They have. Uh, they lose relatives to horrible things like cancer. They have a lot of emotion. And, and Ali, um, you know, he wears his heart on his sleeve. Uh, and he'll speak up when he, he sees it, it's right. And I encourage him to do that. Um, I consider myself kind of a, you know, a player's coach, more of a, an organic coach that will take everybody's information uh, and, 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 and adjust to things. We have kids on my, my roster from 16 years old to, to 35 years old. So from 12 different countries, it's this this melting pot. And, and for Ali to be our leader and to make a statement like that and lead by example for me was, was powerful. It really made me uh, proud uh, as a coach. Uh, and, you know, I, I think it was, uh, you know, in a, in a way – one of the biggest moments of our season, you know, three points was nice on that day and winning five, one in DC was great, but that was, uh, that was powerful, man. That was awesome. Uh, and something that uh, I'll never forget. And, you know, Ali's, uh, we've been together now for a while and he's, there's no better person to lead your team and represent your city than Alejandro Bedoya. I also loved how he handled it after that. Just like, you know, just someone who's clearly, uh, someone who should be a captain, someone who's like not afraid of answering the tough questions and getting back in there. Because to me, it just seems insane. If someone's saying we got to end gun violence and everyone's like, no, I'm like, so you want more gun violence? You know what I mean? Like yeah. you understand what you're getting mad at here. Right. Um, speaking of Alejandro Bedoya and you mentioned a little bit about comedy, uh, one of the uh, Bill Burr's former openers, now a headliner in his own, Paul Verzi. I don't know if that name rings a bell. Yeah. Good friend yeah. of mine. Uh, he shot, really? Yeah, he shot me a text message. He goes, you know this guy Alejandro Bedoya? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> dude, I've heard of him. I do a soccer <laughs> show, you know? Yeah, yeah, and he goes, yeah. I'm staying at the hotel with his team. He goes, he went downstairs to get breakfast, and I guess he crossed paths with the with your union uh, team. And he okay, goes, what city? Do you remember? What I city don't remember. I'm no. thinking it might be Dallas. It might be Dallas okay. or Houston. Um, but gotcha. he he shot me a message. He goes, yo, that guy's got nice sneakers. He's like, I asked him about his sneakers because Paul Verzi's a sneakerhead. And he goes, Bedoya's yeah. like just rattles off like these are the the three exclusive X mm. plus X like the exact collab like the the specialty of the sneaker. And he goes, yeah. He goes, told me play soccer. He's like, you might, you might want to talk to him. Maybe he plays at, <laughs> maybe he plays at a high level. I go, buddy, he played for the national team. <laughs> and he goes, all right, well, I just know him as a sneaker guy. So Paul Mersey knows who Alejandro Bader is because of his sneakers. It has nothing to do with soccer. <laughs> That's awesome. Like, my guys have some good sneakers. Alejandro's uh, towards the top of the list for sure. Okay. It's the one thing maybe I can still kind of stay cool with them with because um, I like sneakers myself. Yeah, it's <laughs> but no, Ali, Ali's the man. Ali's the man. Well, I'm curious. What's your what's your favorite uh, sneaker? What's uh what's your main thing? I'm a I'm a Jordan. I'm old, so I'm 40 now. So I'm like I'm a Jordan one guy. I like the low tops. I got a pair on. Okay, okay. crab check. Right. <laughs> oh, you guys, you got to go give me the, Ooh, yeah, with the with the UNCs. Yeah, the UNC Jordan one. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I'm I'm into sneakers. Uh, I I like it a lot. I like them a lot. I'm not like a waiting waiting line for sleep overnight like some of the people around the corner from me do at the the, the sneaker stores. Wouldn't, but wouldn't it be hilarious to see Jim wow. Curran on the line with have <laughs> have a tent set up to yeah. <laughs> some Jordan just reselling your messaging your academy kids like I'm gonna get it for yeah. free. <laughs> <laughs> what size yeah. you need? I know Don Garber is also a big sneaker guy. Have you ever talked to him about sneakers? I haven't actually. Yeah, no, yeah. I haven't. I, that's awesome. I know he he always looks sharp. You know yeah. he can dress. That's for sure. So and he's got the. Uh, he can buy the good sneakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we got to go down to Philly, do a little sneaker shopping with Jim Curry. Yeah, there's some and good Alejandro spots. Bedoya. There's some good we spots. Should, yeah. 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 Well, um, so we have uh, our uh, our Gully Squad, which is our, our more dedicated fans, and they they have uh, uh, they sent in some questions. So I wanted to uh, send okay. one over to you. And this is I'm signing up. I'll sign up right after. All this. right, <laughs> dude. They'll lose their minds if they did that. But <laughs> they um uh, this comes from the, this question comes from Mike Thomas, which I feel like it might be a name you know. He's a big Philadelphia. Union guy. I know he asks a lot of questions, goes to live events. You, you probably even met him already. Uh, but he asked, uh, since since you grew up as a Philly sports fan, what's the meanest thing you've ever said or yelled at about uh, one of your own players or coaches? And he's saying that this comes from a, a place of love. Like, how did you encourage someone by either being mean or rough uh, with them? So is this the meanest thing I've ever said or the meanest thing I've ever seen? Uh, I've seen said, some bad things. Said. Well, you know what? Let's, let's, as a caveat, let's get that as well. 
Oh, man, the worst thing I ever saw a Philly fan do was actually Eagles Tampa Bay Bucks playoff game. I was we had a we had a, I'll just say we had a fun tailgate. It, it was getting late. There's a guy in a Bucks jersey walked in front of us with his kid in, in Bucks jersey. He got harassed really bad. He started to run his mouth. It was a mob mob mentality kicked in. Yeah. They they got this guy and it was not pretty. He got beat up while his while his poor kid is oh standing there. I'm not doing why am I talking negative yeah, about yeah. Philadelphia? Now you guys trapped me right in there. <laughs> this is the worst thing I saw. So okay. <laughs> anyway, the cops came over and they, they took the the poor guy from with the Tampa jersey went and wound up with his kid going in the car and it was I just remember looking at it going like this isn't right. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> too much. <laughs> Bad stuff. <sorry. laughs> I hold on. I have a question from Sean Forsyth, which is, what position would Gritty play on your club? <laughs> Gritty, Gritty, oh, Gritty the famous uh, mascot. <laughs> yeah, the, the crazy mascot. He's he's kind of a jerk too. Uh, he he would probably be. He's got the girth, so throw him in the goal. I was okay. thinking the same thing. It's yeah. hard to get one past him. Plus, what's more intimidating than if you're one on one with him? Those googly eyes looking at you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We got more with Jim Curtin when we get back after this. <laughs> We are back with head coach Jim Curtin. Uh, so we have another question from a fan, a Gully Squad member. He asked, this is from Sean Mateo. He says, uh, if you could change the outcome of one game in your union coaching career, what game would it be? That's easy. Well, there's three of them. Uh, the three Open Cup finals, man. Those those were tough. You yeah. know? I, I would actually take, um, you know, the, the first one against Seattle, you know, when you look back at it, we were just kind of happy to be there. That's the one I'd want to steal because – if we could, if we could win that one, um, I think that it it would have instilled such a, a level of confidence uh, in the club. Uh, and that one was tough, you know. They had got Clint Dempsey over. They brought over Femi Martins off the bench in that game. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. go back yeah. and look through it, but that was a tough one. Um, we lost in, in extra time, which was always is, is devastating. Uh, but the Open Cup final, you know, winning that one against Seattle, the first one maybe gives you momentum for the others. The KC goes to PKs. It can go either way. And then, God, we got our ass kicked in Houston uh, a couple of years back. That was, was never really a game. So uh, but that would be the, the, the biggest one if I could change uh, one result. Yeah, um, what, the, the final lift yeah, the trophy for the I, I'm curious what you um because the the, the Philadelphia Union uh, are you know the, especially the last couple of years it's like been incremental the just the interest uh, amongst Philly fans I mean there's there's definitely a lot more people doing a lot more to uh, just make the union uh, like relevant, you know, related to the other sports because everybody gets like, you know, with the, you know, Philly is known as the NFL town. Um, what do you think uh, having, you know, winning a trophy, how do you think it would change the perception of um, the union uh, compared to the other sports? Yeah, I think it's it's our big first step. You know, you have to win the, the first trophy at a club. and In a lot of ways, it's the hardest one to get. Uh, it's what keeps you driving. Uh, I've heard you guys mention it too. You learn so much from from failure, as hard as it is, uh, getting so close. Uh, I think the players that were on those rosters, they're, they're, they still gained valuable experience in those big games. And once you get a taste of them, you know, not not dissimilar to the playoffs and, and tasting what those games are like, um, you learn so much uh, about yourself, uh, about things you could maybe do differently, uh, but also about uh, the entire group and, and what we're about. So uh, as hard as it is to lose in, in the final, um, I still have to – say you do learn a ton from those and look i've been fortunate enough to win a couple trophies as well and, and there's no better feeling uh, it's permanent it's forever but like i mentioned it's the hardest thing at a club to to win that first one is is key and, and that's going to be uh what keeps me up at night and yeah, yeah. <laughs> moving forward man to, to get that first one uh, there's no better feeling to give that to your fans uh, we got a, a great question from uh, Peter Carcia, and uh, we talked about it a little bit, but most times you see coaches in a place for three years. He says, what's it like to have the job as long as you've had, but also have it be in, in what a lot of people would consider a volatile environment um, and, and just coaching in Philadelphia is sports in general. But what, how does that feel like, uh, you know, what are some of the things that you would give to towards the longevity of it? Yeah. You, you... You look up and, you know, I think it's Peter Vermees, Benny Olsen, and, and then myself now uh, on that list of guys that maybe have been around for, for five years or longer. Um, you know, Caleb Porter uh, would crack the joke once a year in the uh, in the very first start of the, the – 
the, the season, they have a picture with all the head coaches. And he, he would look around and he would always say, uh, just make the picture. That's the goal. <laughs> just make the picture. Yeah, like, it's so simple, but like you kind of look around and go, yeah, eight of these, eight or nine of these dudes aren't going to be here next year when we take this picture. Don't be one of them, you know? So, yeah. And again, it's a, it's a challenge. You know, each year has different uh, hurdles. Uh, I've been very fortunate to have – uh, an ownership group in, in Jay Sugarman, Richard Leibovich, and Richie Graham, who they did have this longer term vision. Uh, so they did let me uh, make some mistakes to learn along the way. Uh, look, I was 34 when I was named the head coach. And I will say, I'm not supposed to say, I knew everything and I was ready. I wasn't ready. You know, I, I, was, I wasn't ready at all. Uh, I learned on the fly. Uh, I think I've grown from that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think the. The longevity piece, look, it's pro sports, man. Not many coaches last. This is going to be my sixth season. Uh, not many last that long, and I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, but, again, to do it in my hometown now is something that kind of drives me a little bit more, and we have had success recently, and uh, I want to keep that going. Man. Of course. Again, of course. And, and when it comes to the coaching during this lockdown, during quarantine, uh, how, well, what's the connection to the players uh, and making sure that they're still fit in yeah. case uh, the game start up again? How are you handling that? Initially, you just want to connect with them on the human level. So initially, the first thing was FaceTime with each guy, make sure they're healthy make sure they're safe again we have 12 different countries here we have young kids that are here by themselves with no family members so wow. it, it's, it's hard on the human level first and foremost so anything i say soccer from here on out is going to be yeah, yeah. just recognize i do i value that the most everybody's safe and healthy that's number one and that's most important but since then now um, as time has gone by we, we've evolved into individual workouts uh the guys the one advantage you can have when we do start this thing up again is is being in the best shape you've ever been in um, and that could be your only competitive advantage you can get right now really um but we've broken them up into uh, different groups so we have uh, film analysis that we're doing we're, we're taking different opponents from the league even though there's only two games of film out there so far of them you can steal a little from preseason. Just keep watching the Glessness goal over yeah, and over. Yeah, we yeah. Can watch that over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But we're taking opponents. Uh, for example, last week we did Kansas City. We broke them down. Uh, different things they did really well uh, so far. Uh, so you're constantly trying to teach and get better uh, in that regard. We'll have, um, you know, defenders, midfielders, and forwards in three different sessions uh, of film. They also get individual film sessions. So we're keeping them busy. We're trying to improve uh, in all the ways. Uh, little ways that we can yeah. but the biggest thing guys right now obviously uh, as everybody knows is, is everybody staying safe and healthy Absolutely. of course once we get started it will be it will be great to have sports back for sure oh that's for sure we got more when we get back after this We are back, and thank you so much, uh, Head Coach Jim Curtin of the Philadelphia Absolutely. Union, for uh, for joining us. Uh, this has been uh, this, is, this is incredible. This is the, uh, our first head coach on the TV show, so that's uh, that's that will you'll always be our first head coach. Uh, yeah, that's good, man. That's good to hear. <laughs> uh, so, guys, thank you so much uh, for watching. Make sure you uh, follow the, the Fubo Sports YouTube cha channel. Follow the Soccer Cooligans YouTube channel. And, uh, Coach, is there anything uh, you want to let people know about? No, I just want to say thank you for having me, man. This was this was really fun. It's good to talk about people that are knowledgeable about the game and, and continue to grow the game in this country. I think we're all in the same boat in that regard, and you guys are doing it in a in a cool way, man. It's really it's it's uh, something that uh, I've watched you guys in the past, but to be on the the podcast here is something that's special. Uh, and again, continue to make the game cool. Uh, it that, that matters a lot, man. Thank you. Uh, oh, I want to run through a brick wall for this guy. <laughs> ah, <come on. laughs> All right. So, uh, so with that said, so for Jim Curtin, my name is Christian Polanco. I'm Alexis Guerreros. And together, what are we? The Cool Again! <laughs> <laughs>